Support for Current Conversations is provided by Outreach Video and Media Services, University of Oklahoma Outreach, and World Literature Today. Welcome to Current Conversations. I'm R.C. Davis Indiano. Today we're talking to an expert on the Middle East about the region's political and cultural hotspots. Dr. Samar S. Shihata is Colin Mackey and Patricia Molina de Mackey, Associate Professor and Middle East Studies Coordinator at the University of Oklahoma. He's also a frequent commentator on national public radio, CNN, and many other national and international radio and TV news programs. Stay with us for the latest developments on the Middle East. Dr. Samar Shihata, welcome to uh, Current Conversations. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Um, I thought we might talk about uh, hot spots in the Middle East today, if you wouldn't mind doing that. It seems to me that some very important things are going on that aren't getting the kind of front page coverage they, they should. Um, for example, uh, I think a lot of uh, Americans aren't aware of what's happened with ISIS, uh, Islamic State. Uh, could you give us just a quick overview of ISIS, say, in 2014 and ISIS now in terms of its, of its impact and its uh, sort of presence in the world? Sure. Well, in 2014, of course, and before that, many people weren't focused on ISIS or what would become ISIS. And there was a, a kind of feeling that uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq had been defeated and things were stabilizing. And then, of course, in 2014, we saw that change very significantly with the ascendancy of ISIS, the capture of Mosul, the declaration of Raqqa as its capital, something we hadn't seen before, which is a terrorist organization essentially claiming to be a state. And they just seemed to gobble up territory by the day. And they did, and there were reasons for that. I mean, firstly, the Iraqi military was was not capable, really, of defending territory. Uh, and there were many in Iraq, particularly the Sunni population, the Sunni minority population, which felt that they were incredibly disenfranchised, marginalized, victimized by a Shia-led government from Baghdad, particularly after Nur al-Maliki essentially uh, marginalized them intentionally. Right. So you had that phenomena and you also had the breakdown of law and order and governance and a state, a disintegration of a state in Syria as well. And that vacuum of power and vacuum of sovereignty, as it were, state failure, state disintegration in Iraq and in Syria allowed uh, ISIS to fulf you know, fill that, that, those vacuum areas. And there were many who were living in those areas that felt, initially at least, that they were treated better uh, as Sunnis under ISIS than under either the Bashar al-Assad regime or the Shia-dominated governments in Baghdad. And so at the very beginning, at least, I think many felt that the current overlords were at least better than the previous ones. So, but of course, today the situation has changed considerably. And in fact, it is maybe the only, I want to say bright spot, but positive development over the last few years, I would argue, in the region. That is, of course, there is no more really Islamic state. They don't really control any territory. Um, they have been decimated in Mosul and in other cities and in Raqqa. That doesn't mean, of course, that there aren't ISIS fighters still. Uh, some there, some probably have gone back to Europe. It doesn't mean that ISIS affiliates in other parts of the region, whether it's both Boko Haram in West Africa, or Sinai province in Egypt, which recently killed 305 people in a mosque in Sinai and so on, aren't still active and capable of undertaking horrific actions. And I, and I actually think, and I think many do, that ISIS will increasingly move in that direction. Suicide Going after bombings, soft targets all over the world. Suicide bombings in Baghdad, in Damascus, in other places, and so on. So it would be foolhardy to think that ISIS is defeated once and all as an ideology, certainly as a, as a proto-state that governs territory. But that was an aberration because terrorist organizations usually don't, don't declare right. themselves states. Well, uh, just a, a final question, because I think once Americans did focus on ISIS, they were, they were frightened. It just seemed to be this indomitable force. 
percentage-wise, what do you think is the likelihood that the caliphate, the actual territory that could become a state, might return? Well, very unlikely. I mean, very unlikely because, of course, the United States, Western countries have resolved to eradicate ISIS and to eradicate a state coming into being, declaring itself the Islamic State. And also, as the Syria conflict, I don't want to say is resolved, because it's certainly not resolved, but I, I think if we're truthful, as Bashar al-Assad declares victory with the help of the Russians and the Iranians and Hezbollah and so on, and that... Um, provides less opportunity, less of a political vacuum, right? Less uh, empty spaces that are ungoverned. I think it's, it's very unlikely that we'll see ISIS or something like ISIS declaring itself a state and governing territory. Okay, let's move over to Saudi Arabia right now. And I want to give you a name, and I'd like you to react to this name. Sure. Uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Yes. Very big name. Yes, very big name. And as you know, you know, Mohammed bin Salman is the 32 year old crown prince of Saudi Arabia, who is one of the seven or eight sons of the current king, King Salman of Saudi Arabia, uh, who is quite old and we feel probably not capable of governing on a daily basis and so on. And Mohammed bin Salman is interesting because there are really two perspectives around Mohammed bin Salman. And he was recently named deputy crown prince. Um, and that also is a story in and of itself. He pushed out his cousin uh, in some mysterious circumstances uh, to take that title, right? And hasn't he arrested some 11 royals oh. and some 200 elite business people? That's right. In a and very short amount of time. That's right. And they're all or we're all staying in the Ritz-Carlton in Riyadh, <laughs> which I've stayed at. It's a very nice hotel. But, but you um, weren't confined to I your room I was not there. confined to my <laughs> room there or ordered to pay a billion dollars to get release. They're ch the charges, of course, are that they have been involved in corruption and so on and that he is a reformer. And this is, of course, one of the narratives about Mohammed bin Salman that he's a young, forward-looking prince, anti-corruption, pro-women's rights and so on, pro-markets and privatization with Aramco, at least part of it being privatized. That's the way he presents himself, That's right? the way he presents himself, and certainly some people have believed that narrative. Um, and of course, there's another narrative, and the other narrative is m much less rosy. And as I said, you know, he... Uh, marginalized, that's to put it politely, Mohammed bin Nayef, the previous crown prince, his cousin, in very, you know, um, uh, unscrupulous circumstances. You know, he was invited to the palace, told that the king wanted him, and then essentially detained overnight. And he, of course, has diabetes and was forced to essentially um, resign from his position as deputy uh, crown prince. With regard to those people who are being detained or who, who were detained in the Ritz, that's also really not necessarily a story of anti-corruption. Many of those individuals were seen as potentially being threatening to his ascendancy. There were other individuals who were former um, relations and sons, in fact, of the previous king, King Abdullah, who held very important positions, who are in the Ritz uh, prison and who were removed from positions such as head of the Saudi National Guard, who were seen as potential competitors to him. So, um, and the other troubling part of the less rosy narrative about Mohammed bin Salman is he has engaged in a number of activities that have really caused death and destruction on a very significant scale in the region. And I'm referring to the Yemen war, right, and the air campaign, the Saudi-led air campaign on the, on, the, on the side of one of the parties there that has been described as really undertaking kind of some war crimes in terms of the bombings of hospitals and civilians and weddings and so on that has led to, you know, hundreds of casualties and a humanitarian disaster there. Let me just say to our audience, if you're just joining us, we're speaking with uh, Dr. Samar Shihata, an expert on the Middle East, about hot spots in the Middle East currently right now. Uh, let me just give just a tiny little bit of background. So, you know, we've heard for years that there's corruption among the extended royal family. You know, there's so many cousins, so many relatives, money wasted, maybe going to the uh, to the uh, uh, jihadist, Islamic jihadist side. 
uh, corruption in general. So it's an attractive narrative, I suppose, that somebody might come in and say, okay, we're going to play by the rules now. So that's his own narrative, that I'm simply uh, cleaning the mess up so we're going to go forward actually with integrity, doing what we say we want to do. But I think you're saying that there are maybe folks that are obviously corrupt that he's not uh, arresting. There are a lot of contradictions to this. So that narrative gets attacked. I think so. And it's not just me, of course. You know, the heads of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International wrote in the New York Times about how this is kind of selective anti-corruption measures. And we just saw recently the record sale of a painting uh, by Sotheby's or Christie's for $450 million. Dollars, you know, a mind-boggling figure. And the Crystal Mundi, I think. He was holding, yeah. Yes. And the purchaser is, of course, uh, a, a, a colleague, a friend, a cohort, a relative of Mohammed bin Salman, quite young, you know, not known in the art world. And the question is, how did he come up with $450 million to mm -hmm. so casually buy this painting? So I think that the, the issue of selective justice and so on is a very serious one. And I think most serious observers are quite skeptical about the anti-corruption credentials and so on, particularly when we see the other things that he's been doing in the region with regard to the Yemen war, as I mentioned, with regard to the GCC crisis, right, the crisis between Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, Egypt versus Qatar, GCC, the, severing, would you... the Gulf Cooperation okay. Council crisis right. that began in June and so on. So he has taken a number of measures which have been quite risky, not to mention the escalation of tensions with Iran and so on, and that really have not seemed to pay off and that have resulted in dire consequences for with the people in with the Would the region. dialing back of the public offering of Aramco be a good example, where basically they just don't have the money right now, they were going to make this uh, very important uh, petroleum company sort of go on the market, but they didn't have support, didn't seem to have the, the value. Would that be a good example of something well, that's backfired on him? Well, that's one of the lesser okay. <laughs> <laughs> lesser stories. I mean, the most glaring one, of course, is the Yemen war. Because what we've seen with the Saudi-led air campaign, supported by United States arms, really, um, is we've seen devastation on a very, very big scale in Yemen. So the war has left 10,000 people dead. It has produced 50,000 casualties. It has produced millions of internally displaced people. We have about eight or nine million people on some estimates on the verge of famine if uh, medical supplies and food supplies aren't allowed into the country. And as I said, the health... Uh, infrastructure has been devastated. And as anyone knows, Yemen is really the poorest country in the Arab world. So it was already not in a very good place. I want to go there and talk about Yemen in just a moment. Let me just ask you a thing or two more about Saudi Arabia. Sure. Uh, I just want to stress to the audience, this is happening right now. We don't really know the end of the story of what Salman, Prince Salman, is, how this is going to turn out. And uh, if it doesn't turn out well, this could, in a lot of ways, destabilize the region, right? Saudi Arabia is very important for the balance of power in the region. Yes, I think you're completely correct. And, you know, it already has, and the region already is incredibly destabilized. And I, I think, I've been saying for a few years now, that this is really the worst time that the region has seen, the worst place the region has been in the last 200 years. Mm -hmm. And I say that, you know, quite soberly. And what I mean by that is if we look at the region, we see state failure and disintegration in multiple places, in Syria, certainly, in Yemen, in Libya and Iraq, states that are no longer functioning and the terrible things that happen when that takes place. We've seen violence on a scale we haven't seen before with regard to the Syria conflict. Mm -hmm. Well over 400,000 people have been killed, most of them by the industrial killing machine of Bashar al-Assad. You know the story of the Syrian refugees, mm -hmm. right? The largest refugee population uh, in the 21st century, five plus million, mm -hmm. and the consequences for Europe and the region and so on. And so we've also seen, and Mohammed bin Salman is involved in this, the heightening of Iranian, Saudi, Shia, Sunni tensions in the region. And, and, and that has led to a number of proxy wars and conflicts that have really cost lives. So, so the region is in a very bad state already. And I think that action that is kind of heedless, 
um, uh, only makes matters worse. Uh, isn't it part of what people say about Prince Salman that uh, he's wanting to take Iran on more or less directly, you know, not, uh, uh, you know, in any uh, complicated way, say th th they're blocking us, th they're our enemy. So he's, he's really heightened tensions there, right? He really has, and, and we can see that in a number of ways. I mean, the Yemen war is, in some aspects, a proxy war between the Saudis and Iran, with the Iranians supporting one side of the civil war, the Houthi tribes, and formerly Ali Abdullah Saleh, who was recently killed, and then the Saudis supporting another side in the Yemeni war. Also, the Gulf Cooperation Council crisis between Qatar and some of the other states Iran is involved in that because this has pushed Qatar closer to Iran. There's no question about that. And then in Lebanon, with the recent resignation of Saad al-Hariri, right, the prime minister and so on, encouraged by Mohammed Salman to resign, um, that is another place where Iran and Saudi Arabia meet through their proxies and there's tension there with Hezbollah on one side, supported by Iran, part of the Lebanese government, Saad al-Hariri, and the Sunni bloc supported by the Saudi government. When I asked before if the, uh, the Salman impact might destabilize the region, you, you said basically, well, I think it's already doing that. Yemen would probably be the best example, right? Um, I mean, the, just to be really clear, the, the humanitarian crisis in Yemen is probably uh, the biggest one in the world right now. You mentioned 7 million people that are starving. I saw a figure that said in December it could go up to 10 million people. That's right. And in fact, we've seen cholera on an unbelievable scale with about 800,000 people yeah. uh, suffering from cholera. It's already led to about 3,000 deaths and so on. You know, this is something we shouldn't be seeing in the 21st century, right? And, and is very kind of solvable. So yes, Yemen certainly is one of the darkest spots uh, right now in the region. And it is related to Mohammed bin Salman's actions. But, you know, as I mentioned before, I mean, this is a very sad time in the region, a very bad place. And we've seen state failure and disintegration in other places in Libya, where there are two and a half governments yeah. vying for power in Libya, a government, a self-declared government in the eastern part of the country, supported by the United Arab Emirates and Egypt, led by a former Qaddafi general who then turned on Qaddafi, and then an internationally recognized government confined to Tripoli, mm -hmm. and then the rest of the country under the control of other, other groups and so on. So Libya is not in a very good place either. Let, let, let me go back to Yemen for just a second, just to be clear about this. So there's an enormous humanitarian crisis. It could be seven to 10 million people That's right. very quickly. The immediate cause of this is Saudi Arabia uh, blocking any ships bringing in food and supplies to Yemen. So, I mean, this is directly caused by Saudi Arabia, right? Yes, I would say it is. Although, you know, all of the parties in Yemen are to blame for the current situation and the devolution of politics into fighting and armed combat. The Houthis certainly uh, are to blame to some extent. Ali Abdullah Saleh, who was the president for life, who would never go away, let, let came me, back me, to power let again. Let me back up just a second. So the Houthis are an Islamic Shia leaning group that has been in power in, in Yemen since around 2015, something like that, 2011? Yes, they um, took over really kind of Sana'a and they have traditionally been marginalized from politics and power Sana'a is, Sana is the capital of Yemen. And so yes, from 2015, they have controlled Sana'a and much of the north of the country. And of course they are seen by the Saudis as being proxies for Iran, for Iran. and yeah. being threatening to Saudi national interests and so on. And it is quite complicated, you are right. And they were in alliance with the former uh, president, president for life dictator, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who recently was killed. Very recently, Very it was recently like a week and a half ago. That's <laughs> right, yes. And he had been in power, you know, believe it or not, and this is a major problem in the region, these authoritarian dictators who, you know, are presidents for life, since 1978, since before there was a unified Yemen. In other words, he was president of North Yemen, then when the country unified, he would become president of the unified country. So he'd been in power for that long, and then was ousted in the Arab uprisings, Right, and there was a, um, a kind of um, uh, effort made to 
to oust him without more violence than there could have been. But then he came back again. He kind of rejuvenated himself, aligned with the Houthis, who were previously his enemies, and so on, and made a power grab, and his life ended recently. Uh, uh, Ali Abdullah uh, Saleh, kind of a character, right? I mean, he was sort of back and forth. He represented one side and then would sw- switch back to the other. It was a kind of a Houthi leader and then uh, maybe talked to Saudi Arabia too much and they decided that his time was up and I, I guess there's some controversy about how he died exactly. Yes. Was he in his home or was he on the road? But That's right. Probably well, the Houthis killed him though. Yes, I think that part is, is, is most certain and they killed him because it seemed like he was about to make another deal, you know, and I think Ali Abdullah Saleh, either he described or ruling in Yemen was described as being as difficult as dancing on the heads of snakes. Yeah. And that's what he used to do. And you're right, he had many lives and many incarnations and many allies and many enemies. And he shifted allies and enemies quite frequently. So uh, a character, but an autocrat in the end, right? Yeah. Who ruled his country and who absconded with, uh, according to the UN estimates, upwards of 30 to $50 billion. And we're talking about the poorest country yeah. in the Arab world. Yeah. So, you know, that's just a mind boggling figure. And so, yes, the circumstances of his death are unclear, but it appears that he tried to reach out to the Saudis and say, open to a new page and so on. And of course, his allies, the Houthis, didn't like that very much and so on. And then as he was trying to leave Yemen, Sana'a, we think he was killed. Okay. We're sort of moving around a map of the Middle East. We've talked about ISIS, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, uh, Qatar. Uh, something happened in the first week of June, last June, 2017, that sort of rocked the region in relation to Qatar. What happened? Well, fascinating, really. So at the beginning of June, and it was in Ramadan, right, the the month of fasting and so on, um, four countries, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Egypt, severed diplomatic relations with Qatar. And of course, three of those countries are part of the Gulf Cooperation Council that includes Qatar and Oman and Kuwait and so on, um, and that are supposed to be allied with each other economically and in terms of security and so on. And they severed ties with Qatar and they also blockaded Qatar. The only land border going into Qatar is with Saudi Arabia. And so these countries said um, there will no longer be any goods going into Qatar, the borders are blocked, and even there were no overflight rights. So Qatar Airways and so on could no longer fly over those countries. And so this really is, although no bullets have been fired yet, Mm -hmm. this really is the most significant inter-Arab diplomatic crisis Mm -hmm. that we have seen since August 2nd, 1990, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Mm -hmm. Here we see countries that are supposed to be aligned with one another, that have a great deal in common with with one another, now essentially at war, at war economically, at war politically, and at war in terms of the media. You know, I know it's, it's, there's always gonna be a danger of simplifying these things from a Western perspective, but the thread that seems to run through Qatar is Sunni, Shia, uh, conflict. And I mean, isn't, isn't it a fact that Qatar has been kind of aligned with uh, Iran and Shia groups? They support the Houthis, I believe. Um, I mean, is, is, is that the way to understand this? I mean, in a kind of Sunni field, they're Shia and Sunnis have ganged up against them. What, what well, would not you exactly, ask? right? Not the, exactly. No, no, no. I mean, the vast majority of Qataris actually are Sunni. Okay. And they are Wahhabi, actually, also. Um, and so it's, I think it would be mistaken to see it in Sunni Shia terms. And in fact, the only way that that plays a role in this is that Qatar has less tense and better relations with Iran than Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Okay. But no, this isn't a case where there is a kind of sectarian dimension to the conflict. I think the, 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 the allegations, of course, against Qatar by the quartet countries, that's what they're called now, the four countries that are allied against Qatar, has changed. But 
Presently, those allegations are that Qatar supports terrorism, that they support terrorism because they're, they support the Muslim Brotherhood, they support the Palestinian Hamas, and so on. Uh, they incite terrorism through Al Jazeera, the, their, the television station based in Doha, and so on. Uh, but of course, that's not really what the issues are, I believe. I mean, in fact, initially, the allegations were different than, than these. Uh, really, what's at stake is that Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, to some extent, feel threatened by Qatar's foreign policy orientation. Mm. And they feel that their security is jeopardized somehow because... The tie to Iran? Well, part of it is the tie to Iran, but part of it is Qatar's willingness to support political Islam because, and the Muslim Brotherhood and so on, because they feel that political Islam potentially threatens the legitimacy of their regimes, mm -hmm. you know? And so this is a regime security matter. And Al Jazeera is tied into that also, another dimension of it, because although Al Jazeera doesn't report critically about politics inside Qatar, mm -hmm. it reports very critically and openly to a large extent about politics in the region, including the criticism of governments, the criticisms of policies and so on. And the regime in Riyadh and the regime in the Emirates and the Egyptians and so on want nothing of that. Well, what, what about the, the comment that would say just about every country in the Middle East uh, aligns itself publicly one way and then has strong ties to Islamist groups that maybe are kept covert and Qatar just got caught? Uh, the Saudis, you know, the same criticism is leveled against them all the time. Right. Well, you know, I mean, there, there's nothing wrong with having ties to Islamist groups as long as those Islamist groups believe in the democratic process and, and are not engaged in yeah. violent activities, right? But I think in this case, the Saudis and the Emiratis are threatened of all kinds of political Islam, and particularly those that believe in the ballot box and want democratic politics, because, of course, those governments are decidedly anti-democratic. And in fact, they have been the primary opponents of the Arab uprisings of 2011, whereas Qatar had a different perspective. And so whereas Saudi Arabia and the Emirates tried everything possible to stop the wave of democratization and so on, Qatar was not afraid uh, of that wave uh, and so on. I mean, not that they wanted democracy in their own country, but, but they, they weren't kind of trying to mount a counter-revolution the way Saudi Arabia were and the Emirates bolder were. bolder in the way they went yes. about all of this. So uh, I wish we had another hour. Thank you so much for being here My today. My pleasure. And Always nice talking with you. Well, and I, I, I think people are going to be able to focus on these hot spots in the Middle East as a result of this. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you'll be with us next week for more current conversations. Thank you so much for watching.